Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. A portion of God's word that we'll take a look at this afternoon comes from the Gospel of Mark chapter 1. Since this is a, an account of our Savior's words and works, I invite you to please stand for the reading. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. There simply was no warning. I'm sure that probably all of you have seen a story on the news that began something like that. A tornado tears through a town, and it spun up so suddenly, so unexpectedly, that nobody had time to prepare and take shelter. So property is destroyed. Maybe lives are lost, and we feel for those people because what could they have done? There simply was no warning. But in Florida, during hurricane season, it's a different story. You know, those storms, too, certainly have the capability of destroying property and taking human life. But usually, you know that they're coming. In fact, pretty much always, you know that they're coming. And so you have time to prepare, to protect property as best you can, to find shelter for you and your family. You know, the early warning systems that they have in place down there are just a tremendous blessing. You watch the news and you see these long-range forecasts. They'll show these different storm clusters out in the Atlantic Ocean. The forecasters will say, you know, we're really watching this one here. Sometimes those storms are just barely off the west coast of Africa, and already the weather people are watching them. Then as they start to march across the Atlantic, that forecast gets a little more precise. That cone of uncertainty that they call it starts to tighten up a little bit. They send the hurricane hunters to fly through those storms and send back all kinds of data to the forecasters. And after a while, you get this really precise forecast. It has times and storm intensity and a really precise track of where they think that storm is going to go. There really is no reason that anybody should miss the approach of one of these storms if they're listening, if they're paying attention. Just a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating Christmas once again. Nobody could possibly miss this event, could they? I mean, I'm sure that all of us have missed appointments at one time or another. We simply forgot to write it down on our calendar or something like that. Maybe back in high school or college, we missed a class or two here or there. You know how it goes. Maybe you slept through or maybe you were so engrossed in your studies in the library that you simply lost track of time. I don't know how many times that happened to me. <laughs> maybe we've even missed birthdays anniversaries at times, for one reason or another, they just slipped our minds. 
But could you imagine missing Christmas? I mean, can you imagine waking up on December 26th, a friend calls and says, so how was your Christmas? And then it hits you, right? That's why nobody was at work yesterday. That's why the mail never came. You forgot about Christmas. You didn't go to church. You didn't put up a tree. You didn't buy any gifts. There was no special dinner, no gathering with family and friends, and not just because of COVID. Seems kind of impossible though, right? That anyone would forget or miss Christmas? But what about the first one? Who was there? Mary and Joseph? A few shepherds that had been sent by the angels? The wise men didn't come till much later. Where were the crowds of people? All of those in Israel who had been waiting for centuries for this child to be born. And what about the second Christmas? The third one, and so on. Where were the Christmas celebrations during Jesus' ministry? You know, it seems that for many years, so many people simply missed Christmas. And to a large degree, that's still true today. Now, maybe people don't actually miss the date of Christmas. But if they miss the reason for it, if they miss, miss the meaning behind it, well, then the date doesn't much matter, does it? But here's the thing. If anyone does miss Christmas, it's not because there was no warning. Not for that first one. Not for the Christmases during Jesus' ministry, and not for Christmas today. You know, last week we heard God's promise that Jesus is coming to bring destruction and deliverance. And God wanted to make sure that no one would miss that coming. And so he set up this early warning system, a series of forecasts, and alerts, and messengers to make sure that nobody would miss Christmas, to make sure that nobody could say, we just never saw it coming. But the question we have to ask ourselves is this. Are we listening? Are we paying attention to the early warning that God provides? Do you have an advent calendar in your house? We had one every year growing up. I think it's something that kids really enjoy. You know, each day in December, you open up those little doors, and there's a picture behind there depicting something of the Christmas story. If you have a really good advent calendar, maybe it even has a little piece of chocolate or something, or even something better in some of the newer advent calendars I've seen. And of course, the point of them is pretty clear and simple. It's just a daily reminder that Christmas is coming soon. Don't miss it. But of course, there are all sorts of other things that alert us that Christmas is coming soon, right? You drive through your neighborhood and lights and decorations are going up all over the place. In your own home, suddenly the tree appears and presents start to show up under that tree. There are special services that are planned and promoted here at church. Seems like it would be really hard to miss Christmas. Well, for his Old Testament people, God wanted to make sure that it was hard for them to miss that first Christmas as well. You know, from the very first book of the Bible, God began making promises about this coming Savior to get his people ready. There's one Bible encyclopedia that says there are over 191 prophecies about the coming Savior. Prophecies that describe things like Jesus' heritage, his ancestry, the city in which he would be born, the fact that he would be born of a virgin, the fact that he would be betrayed for a price, that his hands and feet would be pierced, that not a single bone in his body would be broken. Prophecies that talked about how he would suffer and die and then be exalted again with such specific and detailed information, you would think that everyone in Israel 
would have been watching and waiting for his coming. But we know that's not how it was. It was just a few. The only ones we hear about making a long journey to come and worship this newborn king, they were Gentiles, the wise men from the east. Even though God had done so much, even though he had written so much for his people to get them ready for that day, the fact is, so many of them were not. But still, God didn't give up on them. He would continue this early warning system even during the days and ministry of his son Jesus. If the people had missed his coming at first, God wanted to make sure that they wouldn't miss his coming forever. And so before Jesus began his public ministry, God raised up John the Baptist to prepare the people for his coming, to sound the alert and the alarm. And you know, even John's appearance out there in the Judean wilderness was foretold by the prophet Isaiah. As Mark begins his gospel, he calls his readers' attention to that fact. He says, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so according to Isaiah's promise, we're told that John the Baptist appeared. He came. And God wanted to make sure that people would notice this guy. So we're told that John was dressed in camel hair, the big leather belt around his waist, that he was eating locusts and wild honey. Meanwhile, the religious leaders back in Jerusalem, they were walking around in their long robes and their tassels and everything else. They were fighting over who would get the best places at the banquets. John was like one of those Sports teams, you know, that pull out the, the throwback jerseys that make you kind of look twice and say, now what, what team is that exactly? But John's appearance, the way that he was dressed, the way that he conducted himself, it would have reminded God's people, the Israelites, of those prophets of old and of everything that they had written about the coming Savior. You know, even the place where John carried out his ministry was unique. He called people away from the busyness and the stress of life in the city so that they could simply focus in on the message that he came to share. And ultimately, John knew that's what was most important. John knew that it wasn't about him. It was about the one who came after him. He was simply there to sound the alarm, like that siren that blares before the storm came. John was sent to say, he's coming. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. Isaiah compares John to a voice crying in the wilderness, just a voice, and nothing more. And yet that voice carried a message that simply could not be ignored. John was sent to prepare the way for the Lord, to make sure that what so many missed at that first Christmas, they wouldn't continue to miss again. John was sent to prepare hearts and minds. And the way that he did that was through that simple message of repentance, through that baptism for the forgiveness of sins. It was those things that drew people's attention to the Christmas that they had missed earlier. It was those things that alerted them that this Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God, the one sent to carry their sins, the one in whom they had to place their trust. You know, it was Jesus' life, his death, his powerful word that gave John's message and his baptism its power. John knew that it wasn't about him. He knew it was all about Jesus. He didn't care so much what people thought about him. He only cared that they heard about the one who was coming after him. 
And so when John's own followers asked him about Jesus, John's simple reply was this, he must become greater, I must become less. It was all part of God's early warning system for his people in Jesus' day. John the Baptist pointing to that one to focus people's hearts and minds on what they needed to know most. What about us today? Do we need someone like John the Baptist? You know, to call us away from the busyness of our lives, to smooth out that pathway for the Savior? Do we need an early warning system too? You know, in so many ways, we have a lot more advantage over the people who lived in Jesus' day. The Apostle Peter says that we have the words of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention. I mean, just think of it. We got God's entire plan of salvation laid out before us in the scriptures, with so many of those prophecies recorded there already having been fulfilled. We have the divinely inspired accounts given by the evangelists that detail not only Jesus' birth, but his life, his ministry, his miracles, his death and resurrection, and so much more. We even have the divinely inspired commentary on everything that Jesus did, given through the words of the apostles. Is there anything more that God could do for us to make sure that we're ready? And yet, the busyness of the season, all the things going on, can lead us to lose sight of the things that matter the most, right? All of the events, all of the preparations, all of the travel that we plan for this time of the year. There's so much stress in our lives. We so often lose our patience during this time of the year. And before we know it, that message of peace that the angels proclaim to the shepherds, it's nowhere to be found. We get so busy at this time of the year that we don't even have time to simply kneel and worship the Savior the way that the wise men did. Think about all the things that we do or that we think we need to do in order to enhance the joy of this season for ourselves or for our children. And oftentimes it has just the opposite effect, doesn't it? It saps all the joy right out of our celebrations. All of these other things that can rob us of that one main truth about Christmas. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. If we lose sight of those truths in the midst of all of this busyness and everything that's going on, suddenly our Christmas celebrations become very worldly and selfish. This season that's supposed to be all about him suddenly becomes all about us. In our various ways, we send the message to God and to others that we must become greater and he must become less. Well, just as God should have left the peace people of Israel to their sin and ignorance when they missed his coming in Bethlehem, so the fact is he should leave us too, to our sin, to our selfish, worldly celebrations. But God in his grace doesn't do that. He continues to sound the alert for the good of his people. In his grace and patience, he continues to send messengers to us to point us back to that Christ child, to point us back to everything that Jesus did to make us his own. These messengers that God continues to send, they are his gifts of grace to us. And who are they? Well, has God sent faithful pastors to you over the course of many Christmases, who pointed again and again 
to that child in the manger who is way more important than those pastors could ever be? Did he give you parents who knew that the word that they sowed in your hearts was far more precious than anything they could ever wrap up and put under a tree? Over the course of many years, did he sit you at the feet of little children on Christmas Eve who proclaimed the gospel to you through their simple songs and recitations. All of those voices, all of those messengers, God sent to draw us back to his son. All of those voices joined to form this chorus with the voice of John the Baptist that calls out again and again the truth that we simply can't miss about Christmas. They point us to the manger and they say, look, there is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And what is God hoping for by providing this early warning system? What is he hoping for by providing all of these messengers that he sends to us? Well, simply this, that we would listen, that we would believe, that we would never miss the meaning of Jesus' first coming so that we would always be ready for his second one. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. <laughs>